decided to gather with us this morning um, in person and our people online. We are so thankful that we still have a church body um, that decides to show up. Um, and we have a few big kind of noteworthy things on the bulletin, so just please check those out. Um, one thing, we're going to do a, a church directory. Um, for the next three weeks, we'll have the opportunity for you and your family to take pictures. Um, and it'll be an online church directory, uh, password protected, that if that's something you want to participate in, um, we'll have a, Brendan will send out a video uh, this week, letting you know kind of what the details look like for that. Um, like I said, I would really appreciate that because I don't know most of your names. Um, so I may fake it, but I really don't. Um, and then the gathering, our Wednesday night service, is we're done for the rest of the semester, um, and we'll pick that back up in the spring. And so we're, we're thankful for our gathering band and all of our um, students and adults who have been coming to that. But no more Wednesday night activities for the rest of the semester. And then lastly, um, we have... Earl's on vacation today. Uh, he got to go pheasant hunting this week. And so um, it's our joy that we have Dean Tucker, who is, who's a member of our church. He's, he's going to be bringing, bringing the word today. And so, again, this is the telltale sign that that blank bulletin lets you know. Um, instead of put, throwing in the rookie like me, uh, we, we have Dean's coming out of retirement to, to give the word. And so um, we're excited to have him. Um, but will you all pray with me before we worship today? God, thank you for this opportunity to come before you. Thank, thank you for this, um, this family of believers. Thank you for the fellowship that we get to have with one another. And Lord, that you remain our focus, even though there's a bunch of external forces that can stress us out and cause us to be depressed. Lord, that you are a reason for joy. And so, Lord, I thank you for the joy that this place brings, that your word brings. And so, Lord, let us seek that out today. Let that be the focus. Let us drink just close off every other aspect of life and focus on you. So let us lift us, lift our hands in prayer and praise and worship you this morning. Lord, I love you and I thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I kind of want to echo something he, he said. Um, you know, thinking about this church and we're getting ready to do a directory and see all of our members, um, you know, come in and, and uh, get to take fun photos with their families and whatnot. Um, as a church staff, we have felt your prayers. We have heard your encouragement. Um, and we just want to thank everyone for just pouring into this place and, and into us. So um, so we, we know why we're here. We're praising the King. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Let's stand and praise him. There's a reason. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we see up through the night. There's a reason why I hope we wait to turn that Jesus is alive. Lift up your voice and praise the King. Praise the King.
could not ignore it. to your hands Oh your takes away our sin, he takes away our sin, the holy lamb of God makes us alive again, makes us alive. i oh. 
round of applause if you believe in that victory. start that one again. <laughs> I believe in the sun. I believe By the power of his blood, amen, amen, I 
dead in the grave. I was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone. To, to wash over us with your grace and your love. And Father, there are so many that are hurting, so many that are in pain. Just be with those that are sick, those that are afflicted, those that have lost loved ones, uh, members of our very church just suffering and, and in pain, Lord. Those that are dealing with cancer, those that are dealing with the virus, those that are dealing with, with, with all kinds of struggles and strife, Lord. We know that you are the one that can help them and you will help them and you're your, your prayers, uh, or their prayers will be answered by you, Lord, uh, be it your will. And Father, we just we just ask that you uh, be with Brother Dean as he brings the message this morning, and, and we thank you for him, and, and uh, we love you, we praise you. In your name I pray, amen. It is a privilege to be able to stand before you this morning in this pulpit. Appreciate Brother Earl uh, giving me the opportunity. I did spend some 41 years in the uh, ministry as an associate pastor and as a pastor. Uh, my wife of 50 years is with me here today and, and uh, appreciate her uh, support and standing beside me in all those years. Uh, when uh, Brother Seth was up here introducing me, I looked at him and, and uh, I had to think about a couple of months ago when he uh, was up here preaching. And he made the comment then, he said, my concern about being up here is that I look so young that you may not want to pay any attention to me. Well, my concern is that I look so old that you may expect more than you're going to get. <laughs> Either that or you wonder how in the world did he get up those steps to be able to, to be before us. Uh, I learned several years ago a few things about pastors when I was an associate that uh, they all began to ask me, I was associate in two churches, and I began to realize when they asked me to, to take the pulpit for them, it was always over a holiday, a Sunday, holiday Sunday. And finally, I asked one of my pastors, I said, why is it always a holiday when you ask me to preach? He said, well, that's when the smallest crowds are there. And I, and I figure if you mess them up, it won't take me as much time to straighten them out. 
So, bro, I don't know if that's Brother Earl's uh, uh, line of thought or not. But anyway, we're glad to be here and uh, to be able to be before you. Our subject this morning is going to be on the Lord our righteousness. And we're going to take a text from Jeremiah chapter 23. I'll begin reading in verse 1 and read through verse 8. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, our righteousness. The occasion of this particular Uh, prophetic statement found Judah the southern tribes since the tribes had been split into two kingdoms the northern and the southern and basically this particular prophecy is written toward Judah although Israel the northern kingdom made up of 10 of those 12 tribes is also included in the regathering uh, down in verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 that God is going to regather his remnant And when he does, he's going to have a king ready for them. There's going to be a king that rises up from the branch of David, which is a continuation of the Davidic dynasty that God had promised in in the book of Samuel that someone from the lineage of David would always sit up on his throne. And this one is called the branch. Uh, Very typical language in prophetic uh, words referring to the Lord Jesus Christ himself that he would raise up a branch, a branch of righteousness, something that uh, these people knew very little of. There had been many kings that had come and gone. You can read the historical accounts of those kings in the writings of Samuel, the writings of 1 and 2 Kings. And you can find there that there were kings of Israel and there were kings of Judah. And just after a few statements are made about those kings, you find out what they were like. To some, it is said that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And unfortunately, that was to the major majority of those kings that were over God's people. Then every now and then, there would be one thrown in who would say he did right in the sight of God and followed after uh, his father David up on the throne. But basically, they knew very little of a righteous king to reign and to rule over them righteously. But now if the reason that they are dispersed and scattered abroad, says the scriptures, is because of uh, the shepherds uh, that had been unfaithful to them. And the shepherds here in verse 23 are not referring to their pastors or religious leaders. It's probably referring more to these kings who instead of leading them toward God, drove them in the opposite direction from God. And so in judgment, God had dispersed them. The people had gone into great idolatry. They had gone into all kinds of sinful, ungodly practices because of that. Uh, Most people liked the idols because the idols didn't have many rules for them to follow. So they could live however they wanted to live and do whatever they wanted to do. And so that's what most of them had fallen into. If any people should recognize a need for righteousness, it should have been these people. For they should have realized and understood after so many years of sinful disobedience to God and following 
in those paths that they didn't have a righteousness of their own. They didn't have one that they could even produce of their own that they could find favor with God. God steps in in this situation and through the prophet he says to them, I will be your righteousness. I'll raise up a branch. He shall reign over you, but he'll be a righteous king. But he also will be more than just a righteous king. He will be our righteousness. And we want to spend time this morning just on that thought of the, of the term of the doctrine of righteousness and that the Lord is our righteousness. Uh, back in the year 1517, on October 31st, there was a young man who climbed the steps of the Catholic Church. And on the door of that church, he nailed what had been come to be known as the 95 Thesis of Martin Luther. Through that particular act of that young man, certainly instrumental and energized by God himself, the church began to be delivered out of its darkest times. Out of that particular thesis that was posted on that, that door of the Catholic Church, the church began to be released from the captivity under which it had been held and suppressed by the Catholic Church for many years. This particular thesis was one that began what's known as the Great Reformation. The time that the church began to be stirred and to be moved in the truths, the great truths and riches of the Word of God. Interestingly enough, that great movement basically began as a result of five word, a five-letter word that uh, came out of that particular thesis and the preaching of others that God raised up in that day. That five-letter word that basically transformed the church and changed the world at that time was the little five-letter word known as alone. A-L-O-N-E. And out of that alone came the five great doctrines known as the solas, the Latin word for alone. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola Christos, Christ alone. And sola deo gloria, which is to the glory of God alone. You see, the, the fault of the, the Catholic Church did not lie in the fact that it didn't believe in justification. It didn't lie in the fact that they didn't believe in, in the death and resurrection of Christ. The fault of the church of that day lay in the fact that it was not Christ alone. It was not grace alone. But it was grace plus. It was, it was Christ plus. It was faith plus. You see, it, 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 there are basically three elements of belief around Christian uh, thought. One of those is that all of salvation, all of righteousness, all of relationship with God is centered in what we do, centered in what we can do and what we do. The works of man, the works of the flesh, and all that we can endeavor uh, to do. There's another one that says, no, it's all by the grace of God alone. There's nothing man can do to merit his relationship with God or his favor, uh, the favor of God for his life. And then there's another one that's a combination of both of those. Yes, it is by grace, but we have to do our part. Yes, it is by faith, but there's still work that we have to do in order to be acceptable to God, in order to find favor with God. This wasn't something that just developed in the 1400s and the 1500s, but this was something the church faced in its earliest days. If you remember in the book of Acts, as the gospel was being spread, the apostles were going out and preaching the word in all the land, there rose a problem. And that problem was addressed by what's known as the, the Council of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says that a certain man came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
And then we find in verse 5, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The church was very young when the kind of thoughts began to creep in already. That it's not grace alone, it's not Christ alone, but it's Christ plus our keeping of the commandments. But it's grace plus our works and our efforts to do so much to attempt to please God. And so this became a disruption within the early church. And the council was called. And we find that as they met, this is what transpired in verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God? by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Grace alone to be acceptable unto God. Nothing added to it. Not the works of the law. Not circumcision. Not anything that the law would demand. And we find that in our day and time, this is still a great problem that exists in the church. There are many churches today who believe, yes, by grace, yes, by faith, but you have to be baptized. You have to do this. You have to make the choice. You have to have the faith. You have to have this. You have to serve God. You have to give money. You have to tithe. You have to attend. All of this added to the grace of God to be acceptable to Him. The problem is not a new one, it's an old one, but it has to be addressed because anything that adds to the grace of God alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, anything added to that demeans the very death of Christ Himself on Calvary and the purpose for that death. For it was intended by God Himself that through Jesus Christ and Him alone, that we could be made righteous. Now what of this righteousness? What is righteousness? And why is righteousness so necessary? Well, I began to study this out. I've never preached this before. But I began to study it out and began to realize this is a pretty big subject. You know, if God says something one time, we pay attention. If He says it more than once, we really should pay attention. But as I began to look through this and did some research, I found that the term righteousness throughout the Scriptures is used over 700 times. And the word righteous itself is used over 200 times. And so almost a thousand times throughout the Word of God, this term righteousness or righteous is found. How do you condense that down into a 45-hour, two-hour sermon? Well, I figured this morning we might take time to just look at each of those verses individually. I hope you brought your lunch, your dinner for this evening, your breakfast for in the morning. Hopefully it can be condensed down to give us a, a better understanding this morning and a greater confidence, a greater confidence in our relationship with the Lord, a greater peace and hopefully a greater joy to know that our righteousness is in Christ and not us. That our righteousness is in Christ and Christ alone. doesn't depend upon us what we can do or not do, but it depends on a, the absolute finished work of Jesus Christ in our place and on our behalf. Now, what is righteousness? Well, righteousness, we find, is very closely connected with the law of God. And we're told on several occasions that to keep the law is life. In Romans chapter 10, verse 5, we find these words, The man which doeth these things that are in the law shall live by them. In the Gospels, Jesus was confronted with people who had a concern about eternal life. 
So a lawyer comes to him in Luke chapter 10, verse 28, and says to him, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, what does the law say? Well, the law says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said to him, do this, and thou shalt live. Matthew 19, 17, another man came to Jesus and said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And so we find that there is something uh, connected here between righteousness and the keeping of commandments, the commandments of God. And Jesus said, do these things and you shall live. But then that poses a question for me. What man has ever done these things? What person has ever done these things perfectly? What person has ever loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his strength, with all of his mind, with all of his soul? What person has ever accomplished that? What person among us has ever loved his neighbor as much as he loves himself? What person among us has never coveted, has never lied, has never cheated? What person among us has never had any other God before the true and the living God? What Jesus definitely was saying to these people, yeah, if you do them, you shall live. But what person could ever accomplish such a task as to be completely, perfectly obedient in word, in thought, and in deed, that they should live. You see, the, the, the commandments go way beyond just an exterior obedience, although I'm not going to ask for hands. I, I'm not sure there would be anyone here this morning that would dare raise their hands that I've never outwardly, physically disobeyed. But the, the commandments go far deeper than that. They go to word, to thought, to deed. They go to motive. And therefore, the Bible would put all of us under that condemnation. And since none of us have obeyed the law, can obey the law, will obey the law, the Bible tells us that on the other hand, keeping the law is life, but on the other hand, breaking the law is death. Where he says in Romans that the, uh, the uh, penalty of sin the wages of sin is death in Romans 6 23 so there's a close connection here between obedience and righteousness obedience which the law demands is called righteousness and one who renders that obedience to the law is called righteous that's interesting that in the scriptures to ascribe the word justify or to justify is the same as saying to be made righteous if I say I've been made righteous, I've been justified. If I say I've been justified, I've been made righteous. And so when Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. He's basically saying, therefore, having been made righteous, having been acted upon by an outside exterior source, I have been made righteous. Well, the Bible is going to conclude all of us under sin. This is not just my saying that. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, after Paul has gone through all of the first part of the sinfulness and depravity of mankind, he comes to this point and he says, Now, we've included everybody, both Jew and Gentile, every man under sin, because he said there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, I conclude from that statement that his finger is pointing directly at me and that God's finger is pointing directly at you. There's none righteous, no, not one. He goes on in that passage to say there's none good, no, not one. Why are there no righteous ones? Because no one has ever maintained to keep the law. Why can we not keep the law? Why is it impossible for us to keep the law? Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, that we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Notice he used the plural, righteousnesses. 
in every attempt that we've ever made to keep the law. And there's probably been many of them we have failed. And the reason for that is Jeremiah 17, 9. Because there this prophet says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jesus repeating such a statement in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. That's out of the heart. Well, how in the world did man ever get such a heart? It came to us by way of the Adamic sin from the book of Genesis. Adam sinned against God, and that sin has been imputed to us all. Adam created in innocence. Adam created in, in, with intrinsic righteousness sinned against the God who had made him and plunged the all of mankind into his sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12, by one man sin entered the world, so death by sin, so death passed upon all men. Why? Because all men have sinned. Now we talk about this righteousness and it could be gained by keeping the law, but we can't keep the law. And so, therefore, we would be called unrighteous. But why is righteousness then so necessary? Why is it so essential that we have a proper concept and understanding of this thing of righteousness? Well, one of the reasons is because of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, in Romans 3, 9, what then? Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we prove both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. Romans 8, 7 and 8. The carnal mind, that's the natural mind. The fleshly mind, the mind of the unbeliever. The fleshly mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why do we need this righteousness? We cannot please God. Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Without this righteousness, we can't please God. Without this righteousness, we're still under the curse, the curse of the law. In Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the keeping of the law can't be justified in his sight. So what is my need for this righteousness? Well, it is to be justified in his sight. It is to be removed from the curse. The curse removed from me. It is to have a, an ability then to please God. Well, how then? Can a man be made righteous before God? And that carries my mind back to our text. The Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. If we sit here this morning and we claim that we are righteous, on what basis and what ground do we make that claim? Over the years in my ministry, I dealt a lot with people coming to me, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I've ever been saved. And for years it kind of frustrated me until I figured out what was happening is that they were looking internally for the proof of their salvation. Have I done enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I given enough? Have I witnessed enough? Have I, have I, have I? The old man has a real eye problem. And as long as we look inside of ourselves to I, we will never find the confidence and the assurance of our redemption before God, our standing before God. So where do I look? Where do I look if I haven't made a list of all the things I've done to prove I'm a Christian? If I haven't done a list of all those things that prove, man, I went to church 20 times uh, Last year, I, I gave so much money in the offering plate. If I don't have a list to prove how good I am, 
then where do I look? Christ alone. Christ alone. I look unto the Lord Jesus Christ, for He, he alone is my righteousness. Romans 8.10 says, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In Romans 5, 18 and 19, perhaps some of the most profound scriptures on the subject. The Holy Spirit says in verses 18 19 of Romans 5, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. That one man is Adam. Resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, that's Jesus Christ, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. How shall the unrighteous be made righteous? Through the obedience of one man. The obedience of of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible tells us there that this one man, this Jesus Christ, became a servant unto all men. And he became obedient, even obedient unto the death of the cross. His obedience has made many righteous not because of what they've done, not because of the choices they've made, not even because of the faith they've displayed. He has made us righteous. You see, if the first part of that verse is true, so is the second. How were you made a sinner? How were you made a sinner? By what you did? By choosing to be a sinner? How were you made a sinner? By faith, believing you were a sinner? How were you made a sinner? By the disobedience of one man that's what the bible says for by the disobedience of one man many were made sinners in the same manner in the same way many the many the same many that were made sinners are now made righteous by the obedience of the one man folks it is not grace plus it is not christ plus it is grace alone through jesus christ alone that we are made righteous. And if Christ is in you, then you are the righteousness that God demands. In Galatians 2.21, For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How did Christ obtain your righteousness and mine? He died in your place. He died in my place. For the remission of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. For all of this comes in view. In being able to announce and pronounce that you are righteous. Because of what Christ has done in your place. What you could not do. What you would not do. Christ did for you. So then. Righteousness comes by God. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll, re I'll just read verse 30 and 31. But the preceding verses tell us about God's choices in salvation. God has chose the weak. God has chosen uh, the, uh, the humble. God's chosen those that aren't strong, those that are foolish. They might confound the wise. God's chosen the despised that he might make things that are not become that which is. It tells us all about all that God has chosen. And then he says in verse 30, But of him, of God, of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, Sola Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Your righteousness and mine is due to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Your righteousness and mine is found in Christ and in Christ alone. 
Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification or for our uh, being made righteous. You see, if the death of Christ had not been sufficient, then the resurrection of Christ would never have taken place. The resurrection took place because God, Jesus Christ, had paid the price. And it was satisfactory and acceptable to God. He was raised again because we were justified by His obedience. We were made righteous by His obedience. Noted to be accepted of God because He rose from the dead. We find there's another verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 that tells us he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. And not just for a, a one-time thing. Not just for something that happened back there 20 or 30 years ago when the Holy Spirit quickened me and made me know that Christ now dwells within me, that Christ died in my place, but it continues even now. We do not have to wait until we stand in heaven before God to be pronounced holy without blame and unreprovable right now in Jesus Christ because His righteousness has been imputed to your account and to my account Right now, Colossians 1.22 says that you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Right now. Oh, I know we still commit acts of sin. We don't feel holy. We not, may not feel unblameable or unreprovable. We not, may not feel righteous. He didn't tell you to feel like it. He told you to turn to Christ. For our righteousness is in Christ, in Christ alone. By grace, and by grace alone, totally unmerited. Romans 4 says, but to him who does not work. Him who does not work. That's kind of foreign, especially in the churches today. Most of what we hear today is work, 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 do, do, do. But to him who doesn't work. Well, what is it to him who doesn't work? But believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It is Christ alone. And it is by grace alone that we might profess and claim to have the righteousness of God. Jesus met all the demands that God made for righteousness. He did it in your place. What you could not and would not do, He did. And even still yet today, when I sin, I quit using the word if a long time ago because I found out that's not true, not if, but when. When I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is who? Righteous. I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I have a high priest seated at the very right hand of God Himself, ever interceding for me. I have that one who's already lived and walked through this life and has already taken all of my disobedience away. He's already taken all of my sins of, of, of omission away. And I shall never, never, ever again stand guilty for my sin in the face and presence of God. Never. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. I am complete in Christ. And the last time I checked the word completion, it meant complete. Full, complete. Jesus cried on Calvary, it is finished. 
And if it's finished, what more can I do? What more can I add to it? All I can ever hope to add to His finished work is my sinfulness. All I can ever hope to add to Him is my unwillingness, my disobedience. But what did He take to the very right hand of the throne of God for me? He took it all away at Calvary. And He sits now at the right hand of God, my righteousness, my righteousness. Over in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit gives us some great words about this. In verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not without also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Folks, no charge can be laid against us ever, ever, because it is God who justifies. What a complete and perfect salvation and righteousness we have in Him. I want to conclude with this old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Would you stand with me? Our Father, we thank you for the great plan of redemption that you decreed, that you purposed, and you fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Father, we have nothing to offer you of ourselves. But oh, in Jesus Christ, we have it all. And so we thank you, Lord, that you supplied for us what we could not do ourselves. Righteousness in Jesus Christ. If there be one here this morning that's not realized that fact, may you open their hearts to the truth cause them to see that Christ is their righteousness and flee to Him for His grace. For those of us that profess to know, may these words be strength and comfort to us, helping us day by day to live in the joy and the peace of our salvation. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'll be here at the front. If you need to come for any reason, please do.
So I'll stand with arms tied and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. So I'll so much for being here. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and week. You are dismissed.